Okay, who would like to ask uh, Dr. Lowe the first question here? John? Yeah, I, I had um, really four advocating points more than questions. Okay. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think we're all experts. Uh, you know, Nina and I have been living and breathing this as uh, restaurant business owners and uh, Dr. Lowe and I have met uh, when I did uh, a presser with the mayor uh, a couple of months ago. And um, I think I wanted to take this opportunity to make a few suggestions for him to consider uh, when they're making policy and uh, things that we notice that may not make sense for us and uh, you know might strike as unfair. I'm sure he's heard a thousand times how, why is Walmart and Costco open when the retail store is closed? I mean, I'm not gonna go over all that stuff because I mean, I'm sure that they've heard it a thousand times. Um, um, point number one um, is uh, we, we wanted him to consider uh, a harm reduction model um, when making policy. Um, in our opinion, it keeps the public safer. And, um, and as he knows, a harm reduction model similar to what, how we treat alcohol, marijuana, safe injection sites, and these sort of behaviors. Um, it's readily apparently, anecdotally apparently to us that most, most people are socializing um, in unsafe conditions, whether they do it at home, um, people are partying and things like that. And, and overall, the Statistics Canada is showing that households and those type of situations are really driving the numbers up. And whereas the, the data doesn't, in our opinion, doesn't show that when people are socializing at our restaurants with all the protocols we put in place, uh, we don't drive the numbers up. So um, uh, we think that would be safer overall public policy to, you know, if people are going to, at this point with COVID fatigue, uh, to to uh, socialize that they should do it in a professional regulated environment like restaurants and uh, you know and salons for that matter uh, you know we should speak for them because you know uh, I know lots of hairdressers that are now cutting hair in their basement and doing everything underground whereas at least if they're doing it in their store with uh, strict protocols at least they're open and uh, they can be monitored. Um, I know how many times we've been, uh, uh, I've already been inspected three times this week. And uh, during the summer, I was inspected 11 times. So I believe that all of the restaurants are on board and, uh, you know, and the businesses that are open uh, do have, do are inspected and following the rules for the most part and keeping the public safe. So that, that would be our recommendation there. Uh, point number two, um, stop segmenting businesses for closure during partial lockdowns. And wh what that means is that uh, what's ended up happening is the Ontario government has picked winners and losers, right? So they're, they've deemed certain businesses essential, certain businesses not essential, and it almost is like a scale all the way down. There's like six classes of essential. And unfortunately for my business, we're on the bottom. So we're first to be closed and last to be reopened where that it's really not a fair model. And by doing that, you're, you're unnecessarily punishing certain businesses by basically picking winners and losers. And um, the way I could illustrate that is that saying that, you know, by saying that we're more risk than another business, you're essentially painting the whole industry with one brush. So an analogy I could use there would be like having a crime wave, saying we had an extraordinary crime wave. And, you know, so therefore we need to reduce crime temporarily like and, and cool it down. And you know what, uh, you know, people of lower socioeconomic status and minorities are much greater risk of uh, committing crime. So let's lock them all up until crime dies down and then we'll let them out of jail. You know, so that's, it's kind of like populist thinking and I remember Rudy saying to me one time, she, he says, you know, I really want to fight to get you guys open, but like 80% of the public wants you guys closed. It's really tough for us to advocate for you, right? But people do have to stand up for us, right? And it's like protect, it's similar to protecting minorities and minorities' rights. So um, I think we have to change the narrative on that, that when we all agree that strict lockdowns work, and it's been shown like 
when we close schools and we close everything down, the numbers do come down. But when it's time to open, everything should be open across the board, whether it would be at a limited capacity. So say even 10, 20%, but everybody gets to open. And then on top of that, you layer on all the protocols so that the businesses that are open are operating as, as safe as possible. The other analogy I could use to that is that in last spring, I remember on the first nice days, the parks were all closed, but people flooded in Port Credit and we had this huge problem because everybody was walking on the sidewalk, right? So then uh, Councillor Dasko had to say, hey, let's open up the parks because you know what, there's no room for all these people that came out, right? And then, so we opened up the parks, but we didn't open up the parking lots. So everybody flooded the parks and the parking lots weren't open. Then people started parking on the street and in front of people's driveways and in people's driveways and it created a bigger problem. So if you think about it, if you open all of the businesses at once, once it's time to reopen, you give more room for people to spread out, right? No, you don't have everybody flocking to one thing. It's like, okay, we open the mall now, everybody goes to the mall and you create a bigger problem. But that's because there's, so anyway, I hope that that logic makes sense, right? And so all you do is for the, for the restaurants, salons, and gyms that are always open last, when everybody else gets to open, right? It, it pushes us further from opening because the numbers may start to rise. And, you know, uh, everybody can see that the numbers seem to rise when schools are open. And I know it's so important to get the schools open and we're all for that, but I don't think we should be shouldering the risk and the blame when we're not even open. So pe people, the perception out there is that we're causing the problem. So I, I know that I, I've rambled a bit there, but basically when, when, when it's time to open businesses, all businesses should be open uh, with protocols. Um, number three, I believe we, we have it wrong by trying to do a targeted approach to, to lockdowns. Okay, so as you know, the GTA or the CMA of Toronto is 5.9 million people. It includes Halton, York, Durham, Toronto, and Peel. It's basically one continuous city. So I think it's better policy that that blanket, that GTA should be all the same color zone. Whatever that zone is that you guys decide because you end up with an extremely unfair playing field that if Halton region is open and Peel region is closed in a, or in a, in a more strict lockdown zone, uh, those other regions are enjoying um, increased activity and increased sales and they might be contributing to the problem and it just pushes Peel region further back in opening, right? And similarly, a lot of people in Mississauga are lobbying to separate Brampton from Mississauga. You know, that would benefit me personally, but it'd be extremely unfair to Brampton because if you open up Mississauga and the numbers start going up, then Brampton gets further away from opening, right? So it's kind of it's kind of like backwards policy. Everybody's like looking out for themselves, right? And not, not part of the collective, right? So when we're in Peel or Toronto and we're in more severe lockdown than adjacent regions where people can just drive down the street and get a haircut or go to a restaurant or something like that, it just over punishes us for being, you know, in the wrong region, right? So that I, I think that, you know, you should lobby your, your adjacent regions, uh, the medical officers of health that all of you should be in the same zone, right? Because that it's more fair and um, it would also probably be more effective overall in, uh, in uh, holding and in, in controlling the numbers as you want to do. And uh, point number four, is uh, the, the 9 p.m. closing when we're open um, is too early. Um, what we find is that when people entertain and come out to dinner, and this is a dinner crowd, this isn't a bar crowd, uh, people are kind of in the middle of their dinner around nine o'clock, right? So uh, we, we, there's a lot of, it's very log logistically, it's very difficult for us to, to get people to totally finish up and you, you're really kicking them out the door at nine o'clock. And then realistically, what often happens is they say, hey, let's 
let's, I'm not ready to finish my night. Let's go somewhere and drink, right? So then they're in an unsafe environment. Whereas we feel at least 11 o'clock would be better because they have time to like kind of clean up and finish up their evening and then they go home, right? Because last summer was, I believe the, the closing time was 11, even though we would have preferred 12. And, um, you know, that, 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 was, that was at least better. I mean, we want to stay open as late as possible, obviously. But if it's the bar crowd that the, uh, the, the, health, the health departments want to sort of uh, tamper down, that really happens after midnight. So anyway, um, I know I've said a lot, but uh, those are, are my recommendations and I've run it by our board and sort of that's, that's, those are four of the points that we wanted to bring to your attention and, and for you to consider going forward. It's not really, there's no blame game here. There's no like, why'd you do this instead of that? But these are just suggestions for you to consider and, you know, uh, try to try to advocate for us because we are feel like we're being treated really unfairly and we're taking such a huge hit. I don't want to tell you how much money we've lost over this process. And, uh, you know, eventually you just lose hope in this in this whole process. Right. And 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 don't think the government's helping us because they're not really. Um, I'm, I'm, we have a meeting with uh, Minister Mary Ng on Thursday because there's many holes of what they're not doing for us, right? So we're, we're just getting killed financially and, um, you know, and, and, and mentally, it's very difficult to, to, to keep this going, right? And, uh, you know, being in the restaurant industry, salon or gyms or these ones that are sort of what I call the bottom class, um, it's especially hard on us. And, it's, it's really unfair. Um, I was thinking about the pure, poor salons. I'm like, well, you have the person cutting the hair with a mask. You have the person who's getting their hair cut with a mask. Meanwhile, I went to the dentist and I don't wear a mask, but that's allowed. Obviously one environment is open and less safe than the other environment, but we can't close a dentist but we can close the salon. So I'm just saying, let's level the playing field. Let's not choose winners and losers. One consistent policy for everybody. Um, all of the, all of the um, protocols that you've asked us to do, we will do, right? We'll wear, we'll wear the face masks. We'll wear like the, the mask, the goggles. Um, we'll sanitize everything. I, I know that you guys have been promoting the outside dining. That's been great but not all restaurants have patio opportunity either. So um, for me personally, the patio is good. You know, it's helping us a lot, but you know, for Nina, one of her places, uh, she's got two places and one of them can't open the patio, right? So, you know, they just sit there closed. So they've been basically closed for over a year. Um, so it, it's really tough. Um, and we want you to consider these things and, and you know, maybe uh, lobby to shift the policy to make it more fair. and really i don't think anything we've proposed is is going to harm the public it's actually you know in a different way if you look at it in a different it might keep the public safer right if people are like a harm reduction model if people are going to do that behavior do it with us with the professionals we're trained we're monitored we're you know we have all of our accreditations all of that thing all of that stuff and and that that could be part of the messaging to the people too Anyway, um, I know I've rambled a lot, but uh, that's 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 it so far. Thank you, John. I really appreciate all these recommendations. Uh, a lot of them do make sense. I think even Dr. Lowe would probably agree with that. But uh, I'm going to let Dr. Lowe speak on some of these. Yeah, no, thanks, MPP Cusato, and uh, thank you, John. I, I you know, I certainly uh, hear the uh, passion behind your recommendations, and certainly you've done a lot of thinking. MPP Cusato, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disappoint you. I, I think there is not going to be a lot of agreement, uh, just, okay, uh, you fine. know, about, and just, you know, and I, I don't want to start out, obviously, with that. Um, I, I know how hard this has been for our businesses, and I know, um, you know, and you, you know, John, you and I spoke about this. Uh, this is a human health emergency and disaster. That's essentially what this is. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I want to I want to make a few things clear. First of all, in responding, uh, I don't own the provincial framework. That is the provincial government. That is through the Ministry of Health. Uh, ultimately, you know, 
I can provide my input and I have provided my input previously, um, you know, on, on various pieces, but everything that's in that framework, uh, you have to understand is not something that I necessarily have provided input on, uh, and also is, uh, is basically a menu that is essentially presented to me as a local medical officer of health saying, all right, which, which color do you want? And, and we have to go on that. And so uh, to the extent that we then do our assessment with the data and the science, then our hands are also tied because we say, well, I mean, even, even just I, I can share uh, with the modifications that were made to gray, I had to write a letter saying, listen, outdoors is fine. Weather is good. Let, let's, let's get the outdoor dining. Let's get the outdoor fitness. And I made that very clear um, because they were about to say, just leave us in gray. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like we, we need to actually try to figure out uh, you know, some way to, to, you know, balance this out. So, so I want to make that very clear. The province created the framework. They present it to me as a local medical officer of health. And then I basically am forced to choose, uh, you know, based on those colors. Uh, so to the extent that I think I'll respond to some of the questions, um, or at least some of the recommendations as a scientist and trying to guess what my colleagues at the province were thinking when they put it forward uh that's probably the best that i can i, I can do and to the extent that i i may have supported some of it i i, I can highlight why i did um but i think the first piece around a, a harm reduction model really really challenging idea because we do know that uh places that have essentially left it up to people um you know to make sure that things worked have seen exponential growth in cases and then subsequently hospitalizations and deaths um, the harm reduction model, as you described, just sort of leave everything open, but give folks a chance to kind of exercise their own uh, judgment and exercise their own behavior. That's essentially the model the United States took, right? And so we now see uh, the outcomes of, of what that has been born in many U.S. states. Uh, you know, I was just reading today, uh, this, you know, the state of Mississippi, uh, they've got 3 million people, less than the city of Toronto, uh, it le less, I mean, just about the same, si same size as the city of Toronto. They have 7,000 deaths. And that's, I think, I believe I looked at it, I was like three times as many deaths as we've had in Toronto. Um, and one of the highest death rates in the, in the country because they basically just said, well, have at it, you know, here are the protections, here are the measures, here are the guidelines, you know, everything stays open, but it's up to you to, to assess your own risk and take that. And yeah, so I, I think, think- I think just respectfully, I think what I was thinking there is that uh, they they have everything wide open, right? I have an uncle that lives in Arizona and he's eating a dinner and the place is full. That's not what I'm advocating. Right? Fair enough. What, yeah. what I'm advocating is like, hey, if you say 10% is safe, make it 10% in every business. Right. That's, that's kind of where I'm going with this, right? Um, you know, because and layer all the protocols on top of that, whatever percentage is safe. Right. That's, that's all, that's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not like, uh, I'm not one of these, uh, what do you call them? The QAnon guys who yeah, are, no, no, fair enough, all, you know, you're, 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 you're against my freedoms <laughs> and all this crap, you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 that's not what I'm advocating because it's not in my best interest to keep my customers unsafe. So I think from a practical standpoint, we, you know, Nina and I, we're like, of course we want to keep our customers safe. That's like number one paramount saying, and we're inspected to do so. So I just, I just wanted to, you know, make that clear. That's really helpful. And, and so, yeah, yeah sorry, I, I never, by the way, John, I, I never thought you were a QAnon guy, just putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we've always had very good conversations uh, in, yeah, yeah. In, in a couple of yeah. times we've had a chance to chat. Um, so I think maybe then speaking to the idea of, you know, I think the, pr the protections, unfortunately, the precautions, even as they're taken, unfortunately, they're not 100% foolproof. We know that. Um, and then especially if you have uh, and this is me speaking as a scientist. I can't. I, I can't speak to the the broader um, reason why different businesses are targeted, but we do know that certain activities are higher risk. And you're correct that there is that difference. You know, like you know, honestly, personal service settings versus dentists. I asked myself that question all the time as well. Um, that was one that just appeared in the provincial framework that we. Um, you know, that we, and I mentioned, uh, I think publicly that we had lots of conversations even just over the last few weeks where we just said, you know what, let, let's look at that one too. Um, and so I think you've seen sort of the decision that's been taken and I'm hopeful obviously that, uh, that, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like our trends are not great uh, right no. now. Um, variants of concern are just out of control. A lot of it is probably related to the fact that we open retail, we open places of worship. We're seeing a lot more household spread. It's just, it, 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 it um, when you're when you're trying to reduce contacts and interactions, uh, one thing you try to do is you try to stratify by the risk of the activity, um, and then you also try to stratify by the size and the extent of that sector or that industry. So that, I assume that's why the provincial framework looks the way it does. 
Um, because as you know, with a restaurant uh, or a bar where you're sitting with next, you know, sitting across from someone who you may not live with, you don't know where they've been the last two weeks, um, there is going to be a significant portion of the meal where you may be uh, not masked uh, and you're within proximity. That is essentially what caused, and, and, and I think if anything, the question that was asked to me um, by some of my medical officer and health colleagues was, they said, you know, you know the data, you know the science, you've seen stuff, like, how do you, wh what is your understanding of this? Like, they're like, would you eat in a restaurant right now? And I said, well, I love restaurants. I know that I'm probably never going to be able to eat one in the greater Toronto area again. I don't know after this is done, but all that to say, like, I, I mean, I would love to go out for dinner again and be taken care of and to have a lovely night out. And I realized I said the last time I ate at a restaurant was on March 11th, 2020. Like that was, that's it. Like I have not eaten at a restaurant since then, even through the summer, even through the reopening, because I know the science. And I've seen the outbreaks and I've seen the outbreaks across the world. And I say to myself, I'm just that that is one of the highest risk activities out there. And so I imagine that was the kind of thinking that went into the provinces developing of the frameworks well, because they saw the science, they saw the data, they saw the evidence that even with precautions in place, you were seeing exposures, you were seeing outbreaks, you were seeing people end up in ICU. And so I think I think that really speaks to um, the, the, the challenge and the painting of the whole industry is that unfortunately it was supported by data and evidence and there's a reason why every country on earth um, in the course of their measures unfortunately uh, you know targeted certain sectors to the extent that I actually have all, always said the sectors that have been targeted you're right John if, if, if it's not stepping up in terms of support I'm like they need to be given support this is a disaster it is like a business that is being leveled by an earthquake or by a hurricane you need to help these businesses out and I would rather that the support be amped up. Uh, you know, I, I think Germany was doing like a proportion of turnover instead of overhead. And I was like, I'd rather see that, you know, pay these businesses, you know, a reasonable amount to stay close so that they can stay safe and they can keep their community safe while we weather the storm. And whether that happened or not, I, I mean, I think we all know that it's, it, that, that really didn't happen. So I think that's, that, that sort of addresses the first uh, two points. The one question I did have for you which I'd be very curious about on the second recommendation is when we talk about closing all businesses, you know, can we talk about, or did we want to explore something like an even harder lockdown, like something that Australia did where um, it was pretty much everything was closed. Everything was, you know, at the door drop off or curbside, even groceries were curbside and you couldn't go anywhere beyond five kilometers of your immediate home. Like, so basically people were like just running around their house or whatever the case, like, I mean, that was something that I'm sure was considered at the provincial level. Um, and obviously they ended up taking the other approach that they did, which was the color coded system and the different, you know, sectors and all this other piece. But I, I, I asked the question, I mean, if you're talking about everything closed, everything open at the same time, would you, uh, you know, so I, I'll leave that question there. Let me just respond very quickly to the other two, because I think there are easier ones to answer. I really do think the GTA should have been the same color. And I think, you know, myself and Dr. Eileen Davila have made this very clear. We've had exposures now in Peel just in the last few weeks that have been related to people in Halton, people going to people going to York and engaging in higher risk behaviors. Um, and I actually have often said, I'm just like, you know, as much as Dr. Kurji likes to talk a good game about, yeah, we've got contact tracers, I was like, you have a more affluent community. And the reality is that your selfishness in opening up York is actually keeping Peel under lockdown. And so I think to the extent that I've been advocating and saying, we need to have like, if we're gonna go regional gray, we go regional gray and we do regional hard gray and get this right. Um, so that we get out of this together more quickly. Um, I think that's where I've, I've, I've shared a lot. So on, on that recommendation, you, you absolutely have my backing. Like it makes no sense why half the, half the jurisdictions are different places. And I get that each medical officer of health like me takes their decision for their community, but it, it honestly, some of the decisions have not helped our community because people go elsewhere, they seek the services, they come back, they have COVID and then they get counted in our case counts. So well, people, think, people work in different regions too. Right? Exactly. Right. And that yeah. that's part of the challenge. So, like it's, so it's not even their fault. Like they could go to work that, somewhere else, there is, there go work somewhere too. else, pick it up and come home and then it becomes our data, you know? Exactly. So 100%, I, I, you know, on that one, I absolutely agree. I think a regional approach would have made a lot more sense and a regional, not just region by regional municipality, but like region as in interconnected region would have probably made a lot more sense or even an entire province-wide approach, which I know is really what in the end drove our cases down after the holiday, right? And I mean, everyone just stayed at home and and we we got to where we are now. Um, unfortunately, it looks like uh, the variants of concern have taken hold and I don't know where that's going now. So so that's uh, that's the one. And then last call, I'm happy to, I mean, we can discuss that one. Honestly, I, I understand what the province is doing there. Um, they, they realize that, you know, alcohol is a social lubricant if you're in a setting, but I agree with you. I mean, if you're going to have 
indoor dining open, honestly, my opinion, it's high risk. If you're going to have it open, does it really matter if you have the extra few hours? I don't know. Right. So um, I'd be happy to discuss that one. But yeah, I guess I guess I I, I mean, I, I don't think we're that far off on some of these. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to the extent that I, you know, the winners and losers are created by the virus, too. Right. I mean, we know that the virus prefers certain settings and prefers certain situations. And that's why I think the framework ended up looking the way it did. But I'd really be curious your thought around, you know, should we just have gone like harder lockdown everybody and then reopen? Because well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a it's a loaded question because I would have preferred that in the past. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe going forward not so much no 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 <laughs> my willing and there's so much fatigue right now am i willing to like do a really hard lockdown now i don't know i don't know you know and um we didn't get we didn't get locked down hard enough because there you know, it was our opinion that you know when you're opening up uh, costco and walmart why they sell in a hunt like walmart's got 144,000 SKUs. why don't they just section off their store and just sell groceries you know i wouldn't begrudge them if they were just selling groceries but when they're selling and 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 putting Everything. small businesses that could only have a few people inside this is where the the whole thing doesn't make sense to the public right because it doesn't pass the sniff test you know i was at costco today and i heard the guy at the front says yeah we have 330 inside i better temper that down a little bit i'm like i can't even have 10 people in my place and i got 10,000 square feet yeah you know but in the red zone i could have 1,000 square feet per person and I'm like, how am I like, so this is where the part where the practical part and when I'm saying when you're making policy, if you can figure out something that's the same for everybody, rather than like, they have to come up with these complicated lists and assess the risk and saying, oh, you're really picking, they're really picking the winners and losers. You end up with all this collateral damage, right? And all this unintended consequence to a, to a policy that you're trying to do right, but then you ended up with all this you know, all this stuff. So that's kind of what I'm advocating for is just a bit more fairness across the yeah. board, you know? And so I, I agree. And like I said, I think to the extent, of course, that, you know, I, I think the policymakers are chasing the risk assessment based on what they know about how the virus spreads. And so and, and let's face it, it is political too. You know, uh, you know, uh, we're all human. You know, I'm advocating for my business because I'm in the restaurant business. But I know a lot of people saying, close the restaurants. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You're in a union job. You're getting paid. You know, you're a teacher or something. You're going to get paid no matter what. It's very easy for you, right? And I'm sure when they say 80% of the people want you closed, I'm sure none of those 80% own a restaurant. <laughs> it's fair. And, <laughs> right? I mean, and, so and, and the premier has to get up there and he, got, he can't say, I, can, I want to balance the economy and the medical anymore because the media hammers him. Right. So he's just got to say, I got to follow the medical expert. I got to follow the medical expert. Like we've seen it all play out. Right. And and so it's just frustrating on our side when you're always getting the one dumped on it, shit on all the time. Right. So you're just yeah. like, you know, I'm not that evil. You know, I'm not you know, I'm not I'm not that. Right. So we've always been operating a good thing. And, you know, I don't know. It's just weird for me. A lot of it just doesn't make sense. I know I, if I could just say in closing, cause I know we're at time and, uh, yeah. and I, I, but I, I wanted to share a couple of things. I'm hoping these conversations are going to be a thing of the past very soon. Uh, we are getting a whole ton of vaccine. And I think to the extent that we can encourage everyone, anybody and everybody, we know our 70 pluses, I'm hoping to go 60 plus soon, like just get people out there, get them vaccinated. That's going to be what's really going to what, turn this around and we'll get out of this whole color coding uh, system and all that other stuff. I think the only other thing that I would share is we saw it in other places where you, you know, it's, it is a balance, you're right, between lives and livelihoods and trying to figure out how we, you know, avoid overwhelming the hospitals and the ICUs and all the death and dismay that is associated. And we've seen elsewhere in the world, even Brazil right now is a really great example of what's happening down there um, when things get out of hand um, versus, you know, certainly the impacts of COVID. And then, like I said, the support that could be available for businesses that are impacted, but maybe that was part of the equation in the course of this disaster that hasn't had it, hadn't fully eventuated. Um, but I, know, I think we know what happens and we've seen what happens in places where the balance tilts too far to the other side, where the virus spins out of control, the exact same losses happen. The, like people don't go out for dinner because they feel like it's ICU roulette. People don't go and see friends because, you know, everyone's just dying and in the ICU and they just know someone who knows someone who's, you know, lost someone. And so I think we did try to find a balance, at least, you know, from the scientific community here, we tried to find a balance here. 
you're right, it was politicized. You're right that there were challenges. I can't speak to the politics behind it because that's not part of my role. My role is to just speak to the data and the evidence and the science. Um, but, um, you know, I think, uh, I think, like I said, we did, we had the lowest uh, number of deaths out of any of the G7 countries, saving except for Japan. Um, we never had ICU capacity overwhelmed the way that we saw in, uh, you know, in New York, in Los Angeles, in, you know, parts of France and Spain. Like, I think we've, we saved lives. And I know that it's, uh, oh, it's no difficult. I know that it's difficult now. Um, and I know that the sacrifices were made and, and there was a certain, there is a certain imbalance driven both by the science and by the by the politics, but I want you to know that I've always said that businesses that have been impacted need to get more support. They need to get all the support, especially those that are more heavily impacted, because this is a disaster like any other disaster. And you know, if it was any, if it was an earthquake or hurricane or ice storm, you'd be getting support. So I, I really think, I hope that I hope the support comes because I think uh, that sacrifice and those lives saved need to be recognized. Okay, well, I'd, I'd say thank you. I, I know I dominated the thing, but. Okay. Uh, uh, but we, we thank you for your time. Dr. Lowe, thank can you. I ask a quick question? Um, people that come into our airport, uh, do they get counted under Peel? No, nope. uh, it counts are all by, uh, by health unit of residence. So okay. if it's a Peel resident, then yeah. I figured that, but what about people that come from other countries that don't reside here? Do they go under Peel? Uh, so at this point in time, uh, non-Canadians have not been, there have been very few non-Canadians that have been admitted. Uh, as you know, the border is closed to non-essential travel for people who are not Canadian citizens or permanent residents. Um, but if they, uh, I guess if they were to test positive, they would count as under the federal, because the federal government has a, a tracker for visitors as well. And and because they wouldn't have a resident, they, because they wouldn't have an Ontario resident address, they wouldn't be able to be inputted into our system anyway. So it would be counted under federal numbers. Thank you for that. Okay. Listen, I, I wanted to thank you all for the opportunity. I will take the record. I took copious notes. I don't know if you saw, I wrote them down in my book um, and I will share them with my team to the extent that we are really trying to continue to find this balance. I, I wanna thank you all for your patience and uh, and you know certainly all your sacrifice. And I hope that any and all support can be given to you and your members. Thank you for the patios at least. <laughs> thank you Hopefully so much. We, I'm hoping we can keep them open. You know, we gotta, yeah, we gotta keep those get those cases down and get that vaccine out there. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. If you guys want to stay on and ask me other questions, you can. Well, if, if, um, would it be helpful to, to advocate for changing some of the uh, color coding to the yeah. Ontario in Ontario? I think like, what gonna... like some of what I asked him really wasn't about yeah. him, but I, I wanted him to know, yeah. you know, he, he does choose the color of the region, you know, so I think that was appropriate. He, he gives us the recommendations at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we like, we can't vary from his recommendations. That's the, you know, no, I know that they're, they're know, holding all the power. Like I've seen, I've seen like, you know, respectfully, I saw, you know, Brown and Crombie advocating for something, and then uh, William Osler Hospital says sends out a letter saying that's reckless, and then boom, everything flips. I know, <laughs> like I've seen it happen, right? Yeah. So the doctors now the doctors are holding all the power. They are.